So our next presenter is Kaylee McGinnis. And Kaylee McGinnis began exploring watercolor originally when she was a student living in Savannah, Georgia. It was while she was um, pursuing a degree in visual communication. She especially likes the lightness of watercolor as compared to other types of paint and how easy it is to bring along and use while you're traveling. And she's going to uh, do a demonstration here of how she creates these beautiful watercolor paintings of houses. So. Uh huh. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Um, I do want to say a quick disclaimer. This is not my house. It's a, seen a lot of walks around the neighborhood and just thought it was really beautiful. So I picked this one to paint for the demonstration. Nice. Before we get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools that I'm going to be using today. And these are the things that I recommend anyone who is interested in doing watercolor. I recommend them getting some of these tools. So I always have... Hallie, it looks like your video is not so playing. Can we can hear it, but we can't see it playing. Can you see it now? Before we get started... I'll For try it there, I should. Okay. Started. I'm going to talk a little bit about the tool that I'm going to be using today. And these are also things that I recommend anyone who is interested in doing watercolor. I recommend them getting some of these tools. So I always have a ruler handy so I can measure out the watercolor paper um, size that I want to use. And also so I can mark the border. I typically work in a four by six or a spider color paper size with a half inch border on it. I like to lay in the under drawing first before I get started on my watercolor. So I use a soft wood pencil and I also use a mechanical pencil. Both of these have soft lead in them. So I'm not going to be making really dark pencil marks. I'm just gonna be sketching it in. The erasers that I use the most are my kneaded eraser. Not only is it a great eraser, but it's also a great stress reliever because you can manipulate it so much. And this is just used for picking up a graphite after I'm finished with the underdrawing. And then a plastic eraser, which is great for erasing any big mistakes that I make. You're going to see me taping down my watercolor paper in a moment. Washi tape is also great tape to use, but in this video I'm going to use painter's tape. It's found at any hardware store or home improvement store. But if you want to make your painting extra cute and you have some washi tape, I would suggest using that. And you want to use these tapes because they won't damage your watercolor paper whenever you pull them up at the end. All right, let's talk about our brushes. The largest brush I use is the Cosmotop Spin number eight, and I just use it for laying in a lot of washes. It's great at holding a lot of water and a lot of pigment. And then my round top brushes, starting with number eight to number two here. There's eight, six, four, and two. And I really love to use these because they maintain such a precise point even the bigger ones. They have a great point on them, which lets you get really detailed in your work. Also, I have a toothbrush that I use. It's great for laying in trees and grass. It helps your marks to be more random and just makes it look more natural, like real trees and real grass. And paper towels are also really handy to have close by. Um, I use them a lot for picking up any extra colors that I've dropped down that I don't want, or if I've put down too much water, I can pick it up with a paper towel. You'll see me use them a lot in the video. You always need to have some paint water close by whenever you're going to be painting. And you want to change out your water about every time that you switch colors. It'll keep your watercolor palette from getting too muddy. 
and it'll help the colors on your painting to remain vibrant. This is my small palette, which is great for traveling. So I'm not gonna use it today since I'm going to be stationary. I've had this for almost 10 years and you can see like how much of the watercolor cakes are left. And this is the palette that I am going to be using today. Uh, I don't clean it. I just let the colors build up because you never know. On the next painting, you might want to use that gray or you might want to use that pink. You might need a color that you've already mixed. And with cleaning, the palette just kind of erases some of the mixing work that you've already done. These are the two brands and types of watercolor paper that I use. Arches is by far the better brand because it is made of 100% and cotton and this allows the paper to really absorb all the water and pigment that you put down and the cold press is a textured paper the difference between cold press and hot press watercolor is that the cold press has a texture to it and the hot press will just be flat i really like having a little texture to my paintings whenever they're finished it is a little more expensive but i would definitely recommend it if you're working professionally and the paper that I practice a lot on is Strathmore watercolor. I'm not quite sure what the percentage of cotton is in this paper. It doesn't hold color as good as arches and it warps whenever you put down a lot of water. So Strathmore watercolor for practicing and arches watercolor for working professionally. It really does make a difference in your painting. I get my paper set up. I'm going to take some artist tape or painter's tape. And we're going to look at the highest point of our house, which is the second triangle here. And then the lowest part of our house that we want to draw, I think, is going to be the stairs leading up to the front door. So we're beginning our drawing with a soft lead pencil and we have our kneaded eraser and our plastic eraser handy. Once we have our under drawing complete, we're going to take our kneaded eraser and go in and just pick up some of the graphite. Put our erasers aside now. I don't think we'll need our pencils anymore. Either. Before we get into our actual painting here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the colors I use. These are the ones that I really recommend getting. I don't think white's quite necessary. I started using it to highlight my paintings, but I don't think you need it to begin with. So we're going to put white over here. My favorite color and probably color that I use the most is sap green. And I use it as the base green for all of my mixing greens. Every time I lay in grass, every time I do a tree, sap green is the base color for that. Burnt umber and indigo are necessary because you use them to mix uh, black color. You can darken other colors with them as well. So those are our two main dark colors. Prussian blue is not a color I use a lot of, but it's great for if you're needing any blue at all. It's very bright and vibrant, and it can be mixed with other colors to create different hues. I use yellow ochre for warming up a lot of other colors. If you need to make an orange or if you need to make a brown a little lighter, yellow ochre is a great color for that. Alizarin Crimson and Red Iron Oxide are the two main reds that I use. Together they make a very dark chromatic red and individually they can be mixed with other colors to produce oranges and purples. And lemon yellow is the lightest color on our palette. It's almost a green yellow. It's very bright and vibrant and I use this a lot to add highlights into a lot of the trees and the grass. So those are my color recommendations. If you're just starting out, you can mix a lot of different colors just from these eight colors. I always start with this guy first. I'm gonna turn my palette around here so I can access my blue a little easier. So I'm picking up a little Prussian blue and a lot of water with my brush. 
so I can lay in a very light blue for the sky. I'm gently outlining the house with this blue wash and I'm going to use the same blue as a base layer for our windows. Using burnt umber and indigo, I'm mixing a chromatic black to start laying in on the darkest parts of the roof and building up the shadows. All right, time to tackle the body of the house. It's a very light color and there are some wood beams that look like they're you know, support beams or something. So I'm picking up red and mixing it with my burnt umber. This is where the red iron oxide is also going to come in handy. It's gonna just warm that up. I'm gonna keep it pretty light. I often work dark to light with my watercolor pieces just because it helps me to build up the shadows. A lot of other watercolor artists work light to dark, so you can do whatever you're comfortable with. We're gonna do the sidewalks next. I'm mixing gray. We're going to be taking our burnt umber and then we're taking our indigo and mixing it in. And if you want it cooler, you can add more indigo. If you want it warmer, you can add more of the burnt umber. The sidewalk that we're getting ready to paint is a warmer gray color. A lot of sidewalks are actually, they're a warmer gray. We're just going to go in here, looking at the sidewalk in relation to our house. I'm going to start on the body of the house. So I'm mixing my yellow ochre in my burnt umber alizarin crimson, and lemon yellow to create a warm yellow. I'm also adding a lot of water to the mix so that whenever I lay down the pigment, it will be very light and I can build up the shadows. My next step is adding some of the greenery around the house, trees and the grass. And I'm mixing up a darker green color using sap green and burnt umber. I'm just going to block those in and not worry about details right now. And I'm using my number eight round brush so I can cover a larger area. Something to keep in mind about these bigger brushes to the six and the eight. If you can see it has that really great point at the end. So even though it's a larger um, tipped brush, it lets you get really detailed whenever you're laying in color. I'm mixing up another chromatic black so I can start laying in details and shadows on the roof. See how that pushes the shadow back just a little? And actually, I'm going to pick up this as well. Because I want more of the yellow to come through. I switched my number eight round brush out for my number two round brush so I can put in some of these really small details. Now I'm working on mixing a color for the rest of our house, which is stone. It's kind of a warm gray color. So I'm mixing some of the yellow ochre in with our pre-mixed gray that we did earlier. I'm going to lay it in very lightly and just see how I feel about it. So 
So to help add some texture to the trees, I'm going to use this old toothbrush, picking up some water first and then the sap green. It helps to make our marks a little more random and look a little more realistic. While we're working on the trees, I'm going to go ahead and lay in the branches. Looks like this is probably a tree that's been around for a long time. And a branch coming up through there. Maybe a couple branches off here. I feel like the roof maybe needs some work. Add some more texture to the shingles. Um, maybe outline them each individually. We are going to come back to our black area here. I'm going to soak up that green because we don't need any green. So here we go. We're going to focus on the shingles. We're getting our round six out. We're going to be working on the trees uh, quite a bit. Actually, there's a bush here I haven't put in yet. I need to put that in. Okay. Okay. Um, that's our lemon yellow that we're using to really, really make the summery green here. We're going to go into our tree friend that we started on over here. Parts of it look pretty dark. So we're going to grab some of our burnt umber and we're going to grab some of our indigo and we're going to mix up another chromatic black over here in with our green. You see how it's getting darker there even though you know we're adding the burnt umber but the tones of the sap green is still showing through. That's why I love that color so much. So I'm going to go in and start adding some of the details in the grass and in the trees here. It's just going to bring it out a little more. And then I'm going to add some shadows as well. And I'm going to start adding the detail on the stonework on the lower part of the house here. Just outlining each stone and following the underdrawing. Also going to add the shadow that's on the beams. We'll keep going on the bricks. Sorry, I got distracted with putting in those shadows. We'll probably put in some more in a little bit. We're gonna continue laying in our bricks over here. Let's remember there's a gutter running down, so I don't want it to cover over that. I'm gonna start thinking about where the shadows are, where they fall on the bricks. They do have a lot of texture on them. So I'm going to be trying to add the texture on the individual bricks to make them look more realistic. After we do the shadows, we'll also be adding some highlights. So there is a very severe shadow over here. We're going to lay in some water there and really push this area back because it is all in shadow here. 
grabbing our burnt umber and our indigo together. And following that line. Since we don't want our shadow that dark yet, I'm going to pick some of it up, this paper towel. Maybe pick up a little more of it. We'll lay a shadow in over here as well. She also push back this door a little in these steps. We're building up our shadow more. And we're going to go back in on this shadow. Just let it. And this shadow comes down at an angle to here. And then go back in. Okay. It's time to pick up our number two round brush again. That's our smallest brush. And to go in with a little detail shadows. So those detail shadows are going to be on our windows. And it's time to go back in to our stones and add some color in. We're just kind of tapping the brush here. So I was checking our photo reference and I noticed that our roof is a little more red in reality than we have it here. So I'm mixing up a color to warm up the roof and this will help differentiate it from our shadow here. See how close those two colors are? It's our red iron oxide mixing with our burnt umber there. We'll start at the top here. This is also going to help make that shadow look like it's really part of the roof, kind of unifying everything. I'd say it's time to start going in the rest of our greenery. So we're just going to do a quick lay-in as like a background. I think I don't quite work like a traditional watercolor artist. Other watercolor artists get the whole page wet and working, and I go by sections and a little bit at a time, and I don't work very fast. I think overall I'll be spending six to eight hours on this piece. Putting the indigo in the sap green just really makes that unstoppable dark green. My red umber is doing nothing to change the color of it. Maybe we need some red in here. We need to get our iron oxide in. There we go, that balanced it out a little. We're gonna wait for that to dry. And while we're waiting, add in some little So to really start bringing out some of the greens, we're going to be using our lemon yellow. I'm going to be mixing that with the sap green. So even though it looks very yellow right now, it will dry a little darker.
I feel like it's this stuff in the painting process that the piece really starts to come together when you're adding all the little details and pops of color in. Getting pretty close to being finished. It's time to get our watercolor white, which I only use highlights and paintings. So I'm just looking at the brightest parts of my painting. They're going to be these gutters here, some highlights on the bricks, and some of the framing around the windows. Now you try to get as much pigment on the paint on the brush as possible, very little water. Our painting is officially finished, and this is my favorite part right here. And you do want to be careful, slowly peel it off just to make sure it doesn't take any of the paper. That's the end. Wow, that was really amazing, Kaylee. Um, a quick question. We're just about out of time, but do you um, do you have a preference for the um, liquid watercolors over the cake type, or is it more just a matter of whether you're, you know, whether you're traveling or home? Or I think it is just a matter of traveling for me. Um, I, they they work equally as good and last such a long time. Um, yeah, I think traveling at cakes are easier and working working from home is the tubes are easier. Okay, nice. Um, and, and do you the the layers are um, seem very very important. Do you let things dry at all in between, or is that a problem if they dry in between? Um, I like to do a little of both. I, a lot of watercolor artists work wet uh, into wet, so they just get a whole area um, wet with water and then lay in a lot of color at once, a lot of different colors at once. Um, I, tend, I tend to think I do more of working um, wet into dry, so I let a, an area dry before I go in with a new color. Okay. Now I have another person who is asking what your toothbrush is made of. Oh, I think it's made out of bamboo. Um, I'm not sure about the bristles on it, but I think the, the body of the toothbrush is made out of bamboo, but you can use any old toothbrush. Okay. Um, all righty. Well, I think we're just about out of time here. Okay. And... Could you hear? Could you hear the audio? Okay. Yes, there were places where it slowed down or was just a little bit distorted, but we were able to follow along just fine. Okay. Yeah, that that was very how. So you said six to eight hours probably for to start to finish. Mm -hmm. And that okay. includes all the the underdrawing part and you know getting getting stuff prepared as well. Uh -huh. It it goes pretty fast once you get into it. Okay. Well, they're just beautiful. Do you do, you do them uh, like on commission for people? Um, I did a few last year on commission, yes. Uh -huh. and, um, I'm open to commission whenever. Uh -huh. And do you do other, um, do you particularly like to do buildings and houses or do you do other kinds of? Uh... Uh, I recently started doing pet portraits. I had a friend commission a painting of her deceased cat. So I really enjoyed that, but I started doing the houses here in Lawrence um, because I moved here a year ago and I've never lived in a place that had such like vibrant, different colored houses, a lot of personality in the houses here. <laughs>
I was wondering if that was part of what inspired you in Atlanta or in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is beautiful. Okay. All right. Well, they're just marvelous. And thank you so much for leading us all through it. And, oh, it looks like I've got one more message I should ask. Oh, somebody's asking if you post on social media anywhere. Um, I have an Instagram account. I can, I'll share it in the chat. If That'd I can. be great. Uh -huh. I don't, are you still seeing my shared screen? No, I'm just, I, I'm seeing, uh, seeing you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, if I can figure out how to share it in the chat. <laughs> Um, if it, do you have a little bubble down below that says chat? Um, I'm still seeing I'm still seeing my screen. I think I think my oh. computer might be frozen. Oh wait! Oh there it goes. Chat. Okay. Yeah, I can I can share it in here. Do I share it with panelists and attendees? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And this is just my personal Instagram. It's not specifically my artist account, but I do post my work on there. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Marvelous. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very, very much. This has just been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. You bet.